Well, welcome everyone to the uh, what is the 11th and the final session for the Create HDR series um, for this year. Um, my name's Sue Olovich and it's a pleasure to be joining with you this afternoon to facilitate the session. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging um, the traditional custodians of the land upon which I work and learn today. I'm on the land of the Darawal people and pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. Culture. And I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues who may be with us today. And you're very welcome to introduce yourself in the chat and you might also like to acknowledge the land upon which you're joining um, us from today. So it's an absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Christine Hatton. Uh, Chris is a senior lecturer in the School of Education at the University of Newcastle. And Chris researches and teaches in the field of drama and arts education creative pedagogies, teacher artistry and artists in residence. And she's particularly interested in ethnodrama and performed research methodologies. And Chris has very kindly agreed to share some of her deep knowledge about drama research um, with us today. And I know that you'll find today's presentation a really insightful one. So Chris, we're really thrilled that you can join us at what is a very busy Thank time you. of the year. Thank you. And um, I know that um, we may have questions or wonderings or thoughts um, as you present presenting. Um, if you're comfortable, we can pop them into the chat and then have an opportunity to unpack some of that after you, you've shared with us. Sure. Beautiful. So sure. I'll throw over to you, Chris, and um, let's get underway. I'm excited about today's presentation. Yeah. It, it possibly won't be as theoretical as some of the other ones. It's more a bit of a rouse about kind of a presentation, but thank you for inviting me and um, thank you for this platform to be able to talk to researchers who tune in to all of your presentations from CREATE. Um, I have to disclose that I'm a UCID alumna, <laughs> so um, it's where, where I did my PhD, so I feel a bit of a, a, a heart tug to Robin and, and to, to University of Sydney. And in fact, my parents went to the Sydney Teachers College back in the day and met there in a book binding class in the 1940s. So I have strong connections with the University of Sydney. And my father then went on to um, run the university back when it was Sydney Teachers College of Advanced Education. He was the head of education there for many, many years till he retired. So. I have deep connections with the University of Sydney. Um, but I'm on Awabakal land uh, in the Newcastle region or greater Newcastle region on the beautiful Lake Macquarie. So um, this beautiful graphic that you see in front of you is um, part of our Indigenous, indigenous uh, initiative uh, that's part of our whole university initiative, which is looking at ways that we can use Indigenous knowledge in the way that we present our work and particularly our research practice. So I'm in awe of the artist uh, Jasmine Crassian, who um, produced this work that's available to us as staff members. It's a source of great conversation wherever we go because <laughs> it's so beautiful. Okay, so can I move forward yes I can okay so a little bit of background about me and I'm sorry for the pictures that don't quite look like this um, I work at the University of Newcastle um, I work on multiple campuses and I am largely responsible for educating drama educators whoops and uh, and researching in drama education my other role I should say uh, is that I'm very proud of is that I am the director of research and monographs for Drama Australia, which is our national uh, association uh, for drama education. And I'm also a life member of Drama New South Wales. So um, my connections kind of go beyond just the research field, but into the professional learning and, and, and in the, um, the, the, the world of teachers uh, quite emphatically, as well as my research interests in teachers and and schooling. Um, okay, so I guess, you know, some of the things that in my role as director of research and also in my own university is to actually talk about why do research, but also before that, what, do you, what is it? And I know just having having Robin in my vision, 
I know we grappled about some of these things in the early days of my PhD because I really hadn't got my head around it, but really this idea of originality and how that is always, always necessary um, and how originality needs to be actually about the contribution. And, you know, we have a very neoliberal context that we work in where a lot of people approach PhDs and higher degree research where they're wanting to buy, make a product that they can sell um, or to conquer a particular economic market. Um, and I think that there's sometimes a tension there um, when we're nurturing beginning researchers about the idea about what is the original con contribution to the field in terms of its significance. And now that I'm quite old and I did my PhD quite a long time ago, I can I can actually see that the the kind of, I can trace the fingerprints of where my own research journey got fostered in different ways before I finally did my research proper. And I think that a lot of that comes with an intellectual itch that comes from usually your teaching practice or your, your professional practice um, that you actually just keep wanting to find out more about and you keep wanting to um, delve into it. And I think, you know, when I'm working with beginning researchers um, at my university, as a lot of us do, it's really about, well, what is it? <laughs> what is it you are really interested in? What's the problem or the issue or the, the challenge here that you're rising to? And why, and also the, the story behind the researcher about why is it important for you to do that? And I think that we are so lucky that, um, we're in a time where we can actually scratch that itch. <laughs> I think in previous decades and generations, it was kind of very much seen to be keeping the self out of the research. And I know that certainly um, when I did my PhD at the University of Sydney, that I was given that permission with, with Robin. And that was actually such an important part of the way I actually structured my research process. So that sort of sense of where do you feature in that is part of it's your intellectual itch. It might not be mine, <laughs> but it's actually yours. And you have to kind of work out the genealogy of it and where it comes from in terms of your life story and your identity. Um, research can be an opening up, an inquiry process, hopefully, a way to know more about phenomena in context. And I think the idea is that that we we have to recognise, as particularly as we do literature reviews and we look at the kind of the gaps, I hate that that language, but, you know, the gaps in research, we're actually looking at relevance as well about where things are, where things come up in particular times and places and how that, that research is done in a situational way so that what was research, having now being a person who is going back to a, a, a teaching practice and a and a researcher who has since passed on it's 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 kind of interesting to look back at the fact that certain things were relevant then but they're certainly not relevant to now in terms of the context of education in Australia for example or in other countries so you know that contextual element is actually really worth taking stock of in the research process and of course, it's a deep dive, you know, and I think that particularly for drama and arts people, that's the beautiful part. That's the delicious part, isn't it? You know, where we deep dive into whatever it is. And <laughs> I did a presentation recently about this idea of the yield, which is a term that we use a lot in drama and theatre about yielding to the moment of as it as it presents itself, uh, you know, that somatic kind of moment. And I think that that is something very much uh, characteristic of the um, the embodied arts, the performing arts, where that is such a, a, a almost a physical process that that one engages with. But it's also a deep dive into ideas and theories, um, as well as practice and analysis for the sake of it. Um, and, but also communities, that sort of um, sense of of dwelling with people in different kinds of contexts. It can be all of those things or one of those things. It can be many, many things. And all of them are right and fabulous, I might add. <laughs> okay. I, in my reading, I kind of came up with this kind of um, 
this idea about, and I can't remember the phrase of where I picked it up, this idea of research as a professional and intellectual flourishing. And I guess that's more about the kind of um, empowerment of the researcher to engage with context and theory and practice, but to do so in a way, particularly for educators, in a way that nourishes them and allows them to flourish in an intellectual way, but also a professional way. I think, you know, a lot of the other service professions, if we want to call them that, often people come to research in education after being practitioners, after being teachers, after being principals, after being policy makers, et cetera. And so they're coming with a level of professional um, experience and knowledge and practice that informs the choices that they make about the research journey that they go on. And for me, I think that's really exciting to watch about where they are. They're not beginners. They're not babies. They're not, you know, infants in this process. They're often highly experienced and have a very nuanced idea of what they want to achieve. And I think that makes the, that professional and intellectual engagement as it kind of inter informs each other, really, really exciting to watch when it's happening in practice because it leads to research-informed teaching and innovation. It leads to rebellious acts and interventions and, and ways of, of working that are alternatives to, this, to the, the, co the context that we work in. Um, it means that people are documenting things that don't always get documented, um, and I think that's an important uh, feature of research that that's what that's one of our that's that original contribution is that we're perhaps putting on the record things that perhaps have not been um, uh, recorded or, or appropriately counted as being valuable and I think that certainly something that's been a really important part of the processes that I've engaged in in my research life has been about change making and about how we intervene in things that perhaps are not quite right or that perhaps are not quite well understood and how research can offer as a as a um, a wonderful space to be able to bring attention to those areas of practice that that are not necessarily or experience that are not necessarily um, um, part of the academy per se um, I think it's really important for research to keep expanding the knowledge base of what we do and how we do things. I mean, times, it's, research is temporal. So how we do things and how we want things and how the challenges we face are contextual, it's situated. So really we need to be keeping researching in order for that to be this fluid movement into the future and hopefully learning from the past and the genealogies that we work with. And, of course, one of the things that sometimes in drama education is a criticism is that really advocacy is such a strong component to drama and arts education research. Um, and, and, you know, while I see that as a, as a valid criticism, it's not without its necessity <laughs> in terms of the context that we work in and the continued attacks on the arts, particularly within the broader educational climate and discourse. So um, we ain't there yet. We haven't arrived uh, by any means. And I think, in fact, we need to be even more fierce than we've ever been before. But that's just my own personal point of view there. Um, so why bother? It's a discussion you often have with teachers about why bother? Why, why do any research at all? And I think it's about being a player. It's about being able to be part of the changes that you want to see and be able to reach particular audiences in that about, you know, who needs to see this? Who needs to read this? Who needs to take this research um, under, their, under their belt? You know, ministers, policymakers, um, principals. Um, and one of the frustrations that we have in arts education, particularly in drama education, is we have so much research. <laughs> done by people in this Zoom <laughs> um, and others, you know, that we have so much wonderful, wonderful um, evidence uh, on record, both uh, nationally and internationally, and yet we see 
a kind of strategic ignorance that is perpetuated around us. And it's enormously frustrating for those doing this kind of research, but it makes it me even I might feel more urgent that we are contributing continuously to this um, long line of work that's gone before us um, to put it on record and to make sure that people are held accountable for ignoring it. My view, <laughs> possibly shared by some people here. Okay. Um, you know, obviously in drama research, like other areas of arts research or educational research, the possibilities of what we're researching are quite broad. Um, certainly some of these things have been part of my research about processes, about um, partnerships, who contributes to what, how does that partnership or relationship work and to what effect, what are the impacts. For example, if you've got funded research, um, often that's a, a big issue for funders about, you know, showing impact. Um, ideas about memories and identities, certainly that's been a, an issue, a strong focus of my research about who are we, what are our stories, what is what is our wisdom, what is our practice, what do we actually do, putting words to sometimes the work that we do that is in the classroom that is difficult to describe or, you know, it takes a storying approach perhaps or another ki other kinds of approach, approaches, arts-based approaches to be able to actually map that one out um, in a way that is relevant to our audiences, um, practice more broadly, broad but also quite specific to particular communities, um, lots of research about particular groups and how they respond to particular interventions within their context. There might be regional groups or they might be gendered groups or cultural groups or refugees, for example. You know, these are all the kinds of um, choices that people are making about what particular groups are we going to actually work with. So, of course, the next part is, is the formulation of research questions and there's a whole art form associated with that. And then finding the right methodologies to actually engage with and answer those questions or engage with those questions. Here are some that I've engaged with. They're not a comprehensive list. Um, I think that in recent years, thankfully, there's been a massive shift away from really positivist ideas about education. That's opened up a massive space for us in the arts. Um, to be able to talk about things that are complex, that are entangled, that look at evolving relationships and artworks. And so I guess, you know, for the neophytes, this would be a, a kind of mixed methods is your friend kind of <laughs> mantra that you can adopt there. But I think the landscape is so much bigger and broader and possible in a way that wasn't there when I was going through my PhD. And I think that that's worth kind of making a note of. Okay. Arts-based research, of course, Robin's a, a, a great um, scholar in this area, but arts-based research has certainly been a part of my life for a long, long time as an arts-based practitioner and as an arts educator um, and an arts-based educational researcher. <laughs> um, and, of course, there's many books and tomes around there about what arts-based research is. It's not the only way to research and it's, there's no primacy of the fact that arts-based practitioners and educators must work with arts-based research. I know John Saunders picked me up on this um, in another presentation I did. You know, it's like it's not the only way you can approach arts-based work. And it's like, fair enough. I totally get it. You know, like for different types of studies, of course, you're choosing different kinds of um, research methodologies that are going to suit what you're trying to do. But certainly arts-based research as, a, as an approach and as a methodology, allows arts practitioners to work in ways that are foregrounding the way they might work in the classroom or the way that their um, art form works. And it allows them a kind of a space to kind of hang their hat and to go, okay, I'm able now to talk about my practice because I'm locating it in there. And it still offers, I think, uh, an avenue for people to work. And it also really looks at, I think, arts-based research really considers the audience of the research in a way that um, perhaps other methodologies may not quite uh, as, as an ex audience in terms of as an experience of the work. 
Um, obviously, even someone reading the work is is experiencing it. Um, but I think that that experiential aspect of both the doing of the research, the artefacts and findings that are made in the research, and then how it's communicated, I think arts based research actually allows for a different kind of communication and dissemination of that research, which is sometimes quite liberating for people. I know it was for me back in the day before we had the term arts-based research. <laughs> um, okay, so what kinds of things might we be researching in drama education and in perhaps in other education research? Certainly this is a drama-skewed list. It's not exhaustive. Um, I think that because drama pedagogy and drama as an art form, the theatre as an art form, is all about relationships, I think that features very, very strongly in a lot of research. Um, learning and teaching, the nature of it and what it is and means and could be and might change to be is certainly um, very important. Artistic practices, so you're looking at particular ways of approaching arts learning. I've got a PhD student looking at Lecoq practice. Um and also forms of training um, of, of, of how teachers get trained or, or um, uh, actors or, or professionals who work in theatre get trained. So that's another area. Um, something that's been very, very close to my heart for billions of years is devising, this idea of devising theatre with people, having them tell their stories on stage and what that process looks like and means to them. More recently... I've been looking more at process drama models and process drama approaches. Applied theatre is another field we can dabble into. Whoops. I'm going ahead of myself. Forms of drama in action. So it could be puppetry, could be masks, could be reader's theatre, what we consider as form um, in drama education. Histories, I think, is really an interesting idea because, you know, as Robin taught me a long, long time ago, um, we don't have original ideas. They come from other places. <laughs> so working out wh whose shoulders we are standing on and and whose um, ideas we are holding dear. I mean, Dorothy Hethcote talked about drives, you know, what drives you as a, a drama educator. And I think tracing that history is actually really an interesting thing when we look broader than just our own personal circle in terms of, you know, waves of teacher education and context that we might work in that contribute to those histories. Policies or the lack of <laughs> um, are another field. Curriculum and pedagogy and our contribution, I know I, something I've written a lot about is about um, drama's role as being uh, innovative pedagogy that can be applied uh, and Robin too, um, you know, beyond our silo of arts education. Um, and looking at the transference of skills and understandings in ways that perhaps are different, are, are unique, that can't be done in any other kind of way. Um, looking at drama education or drama research as a way of knowing or, or, or drama practice as a way of knowing and what that might mean to different community groups. And, of course, there's the more other kind of metrics kind of approach, which is looking at impacts and change. Now, not an exhaustive list, but it was the first list that came off the top of my head as if I was to do a kind of a summary of all the kinds of things that I've been involved in. It's all of those sorts of things. And I'm sure other people will have as well. There are many more and more yet to be devised <laughs> by the fraternity. Okay, I think one of the really interesting things um, that is important is is to to be really conscious and cognizant of the participants in our research. And I know something that has been um, a growing concern, thankfully, as research um, protocols and, and approaches have become much more formalised, is this kind of sense of who are we working with? Who are the people who know or the people who want to walk with us in that journey? And then I think as well, what are the responsibilities we have to them in the way that we construct the process of research? Um, and, you know, what kinds of level of participation do they have? What do they actually do? Are they active players or passive players? Are they framed and empowered in this process or are they the objects of our research? And I'm not sure we we have completely nailed all of those ethical questions, but I know we work and strive to those as being authentic and appropriate. Um, 
And there are challenges associated with that in the actual field of doing research. But I think increasingly we cannot um, travel with our research participants in any kinds of ways that are going to be um, appropriating or, or, or um, you know, casting them as being the objects of our research rather than being walking with us in the research process. So there's loads of readings and, and issues around all of that, but I think that different types of researchers are grappling with those in their context in quite different ways. Um, certainly how we position children and young people is, is, is a continuing issue. And part of the issue is I think that we have in the past seen children and, and young people as the objects of research or the conduits to our research rather than recognising they are deeply enmeshed in the in the in the context that we are researching and they have a valid stake to play in that research and a valid voice to play in that and that we are finding ways of representing the research that actually honor them include them and actually have them check us back about how we are are working with them in whatever research field work that we're doing um i've had the Fortune, misfortune sometimes of being a referee, uh, a, a journal reviewer for some journals and sometimes raising questions about how young people are framed uh, in the way that they're described or the way that they are, uh, they are participants in the research. And, of course, by the time you get the journal article, it's too late. The study's already happened. <laughs> <laughs> so all you can do is affect the way that they're described or the way that they're um, you know, their presence is enacted in the journal article. So to a certain extent, it's it's quite hard then as a reviewer too to go, you know, hey, this stinks. <laughs> I'm not I'm not happy with the way that you're talking about young people here. And I think you really need to reframe this if it's going to go to an international audience. And and I think, you know, I, I worry about this. And some of these are professors, you know, and in 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 places where that's not held in check. And I think that, you know, in the arts we have lots of mechanisms where they will let you know <laughs> quite emphatically about how they feel about what you're doing. They will resist and I adore resisting students uh, because they tell us something quite important about what it is we're trying to do and perhaps the need to go back to the table to think about how we're framing them. Um, but I think the more inclusive we can be and the more um, participatory we can be the better it is for the quality of what we do um, in our research context. But that's just my own personal point of view. And the other question is, uh, is, the, is one of the participants, and I often have students who come through who go, you know, yeah, I'm doing this, 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 and it's all at arm's length. And I go, but where are you? <laughs> you're, you're in the room. You're a player here. You're not looking through that with, at that data with innocent eyes. You're you're a practitioner, you are a, a, an expert teacher, you are, have 30 years of practice behind you. You're looking at that in a way that perhaps others may not and and, and getting that sense of claiming us and, and obviously that's an ethical consideration about, you know, where are the memberships happening here? I've done a lot of work in gender and drama education, so this kind of sense of, you know, I automatically have an in because I'm a, a female identifying <laughs> uh teacher so am I already operating in my membership zone that that is giving me affordances and that's worth continually checking and questioning uh, in any conduct of any research okay so now I've told you everything you already know <laughs> I'm going to kind of focus on some stuff that's more particular to me I'm sorry these are crazy photographs of me um, in the middle of doing a, pro a project um just to kind of give you a bit of a kind of a background of some of the things that I've been involved with. Um, I think most of my, when I look back on all the research that I've done since master's and PhD, a lot of it's applied. Um, I don't stand back and usually and, and research something that's outside my reach. <laughs> so mostly I'm working with teachers and students and looking at what actually happens in the classroom and and what teaching and learning actually looks like and and um, transpires to be when we come together. Um, so the kind of the immediacy of the teaching moment is something that's always intrigued me. Still love it. 
still turns me up to field work, you know, in projects to this day. You know, what is it we do? How do we do it? How does it have any effect if it does? What is the kind of reciprocity of the learning process that happens in um, the collaborative ensemble approach that is drama education continues to fascinate me. My PhD was in um, playbuilding or devising theatre, so looking at how ensemble practice works, particularly with young people and with um, adolescent girls. So gender was a really um, strong focus of my early research trajectory and it still is an interest, um, but very much looking at how devising work and and staging stories of girls particularly is actually a form of radical action in an, in education and in theatre and it still is and I have a feminist theatre background so that's still a continuing interest and certainly a big feature of my PhD was looking at is it possible to talk about a feminist drama practice and what that might actually mean. Then I kind of delved into looking at what other expert teachers do and naming that artistry. How do we look at the artistry of teachers in how they conduct themselves in the classroom, particularly looking at play building and what kind of, um, you know, building on the kind of that quintessential quote from Cecily O'Neill about, you know, leading them into the future backwards, this idea of what does that actually look like? So if that's a metaphor, what does that actually look like concretely in the way that they consider their practice and the way that they talk and, and story their practice? So that's been a, a real um, area of interest there. Segway into a whole other different trajectory, which is artists in schools and sustained part partnerships between artists in residence in schools. Did a the fresh air research study. We're looking at... Um, and not necessarily in drama this time, in all other arts, looking at um, three years of sustained partnerships in primary and secondary schools um, and looking at what are the impacts of that and really and did that with my colleague from Western Sydney, University of Western Sydney, Mary Mooney, um, really looking at this notion of a creative ecology that develops after that longitudinal partnership and also looking at how that um, centres around this fundamental relationship between, as you would expect, teachers, artists and students, and that it's not a top-down approach, it's more an ecological approach where there is a, a recursive or iterative um, spiralling <laughs> over time that time and 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 relationship allows for that to, to grow and develop um, in different kinds of contexts and also to be fluid enough to be able to cope with the schools as dynamic places, you know, where staff come and go and principals change and we've got a new artist next term and, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and the ec ecological model was really a, a way of us really trying to look at how that pulse of that ecology was able to thrive over those, those three years because it was malleable and, and porous. Okay, so that was one side of my research. The other side is looking at, that I'm working currently on these in that last two points, is in recent years I've turned my attention to the work of Dorothy Hethcott and particularly one of her last systems of teaching that she um, developed in the latter part of her career, which was Rolling Roll. Uh, which is perhaps the least attended out of all of her um, wonderful innovations and, and, and gifts that she gave um, the drama education field, um, but looking at Rolling Roll as a transdisciplinary curriculum innovation system. So looking at what transdisciplinary wins we get when we work in it with drama leading the curriculum across different subject areas. A bit like Mantle the Expert, but a bit different. Rolling Roll differs in the sense that Rolling Roll is actually about community. So it shifts from being a do an expert role to care for a community. And I think this is really pertinent right now because we all need <laughs> 
to help children to understand and care for community and build and be active community members. Part of that has meant delving a little bit into digital technologies and drama, in drama education. And I can say that I have just bought my first kit of GoPros. So I'm now going to be GoPro researching uh, with drama education to look at ensemble practice and look at rolling roll. So that's going to be a, a hoot once I work out how to use them. That's my summer break. Um, but looking at working with digital technologies and platforms, particularly I'm starting to um, work in partnership with um, CNT in the UK and working with Prospero Digital as a platform for doing a rolling these rolling roll projects that I'm currently doing. Okay. Here's me in various roles, sorry, teaching and uh, different places. Um, this one's in New South Wales. The one in the middle is uh, in America. And the, the one on the right is teaching Palestinian teachers uh, in Jordan. I was lucky enough to be asked to go there to work with Palestinian teachers. The world needs us, folks, <laughs> as we all know. So how have I done it all of those kinds of ways? I've always been um, being a theatrical person. I've always been looking at arts and arts-based research, looking at devising, looking at performed ways of researching ethnographies in all their forms, the more straight ones, but also um, educational ethnographies. Autoethnography has been a really strong feature of my research practice and more recently duoethnographies um, with other folks where we we hone down on a on a an issue and 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 work together in, a, in a, an autoethnographic process, but together, which is a collaborative way of working. Um, always have been interested in evocative ways of writing research texts, and thankfully that's the great um, gift that Robin gave me in my PhD, where I wrote my findings of my PhD in script form. So this is before we had all the terminology for even that as an ethnodrama or anything else. Like we didn't, we didn't have the language, we didn't even have the language of verbatim theatre back then. So, you know, I've always been really interested in that and how we write from the heart and the head and with theory um, to create readerly texts, performative texts that speak to the audiences that we are hoping to reach and why that's so important when we're working in such evocative forms of practice. Um, it seems a bit of a no-brainer that we do those kinds of things, but not always. Sometimes we write for different audiences, but certainly it's been a feature of honouring the stories of, of the people I'm working with and making sure that their voice is there as well as my own. And more recently I'm kind of dabbling into post-humanism. I don't think I'm quite fully there yet as a devotee but I'm certainly dabbling in it and looking at these ideas about entanglement and you know Dorothy Hethcote famously talked about man in a mess as being the focus of drama and drama education that was very time situated <laughs> and where she was in her trajectory as getting started in her practice but you know or indeed in theatre we're often taught you know 101 that it's all about conflict I think that really when we do dramas and particularly educational work with drama, we're looking more at more post-humanist ideas about um, how we are all complicit and entangled in the web of experience and the constraints of the Anthropocene and where we find ourselves right now. And I think that um, for me post-humanism is actually allowing me to create dramas that are targeting that entanglement in ways that are hopefully um, uh, about hope and about possibility and about um, action. Uh, so that's kind of where I'm heading in terms of those research um, trajectories. Um, okay, so... Um, one of the things that I was going to draw attention to because I was asked to talk about drama research methods is a book that I edited with Peter Duffy and Richard Salas, Peter Duffy from the US and Richard Salas from the University of Melbourne. Um, I still love this book. It was such a labour of love. Um, 
that we adored from the moment we started it till the moment it was published. And I'm sorry, I'm going to fangirl about this because it is the most gorgeous text and I still pick it up and I still read and I'm still enriched by the stories of people that and the conversations of the researchers that agreed to take part in this and the bravery that they uh, leapt into to expose the difficulties, <laughs> the challenges, the concerns, the, you know, clunky moments of their own research trajectories and apply them in ways that are really easy to read and interesting in terms of them being examples of a research conversation, uh, evocative texts, if you like. So, um, you know, if you haven't seen this one already, it's a really good book to, to pick up. Some of the stuff's laugh out loud, some of the stuff's very troubling and some of it's um, talking about calling us to action in ways that perhaps as a field in drama education we may not have necessarily engaged with as a whole field individuals have but perhaps it's 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 asking some very provocative questions I think um, which is why it's called cool, provocations of practice but the remit for this was that it was um it was it was asking people to come together, different pairs or group, small groups of people, mostly pairs. I think there was a three, um, to come together and talk about the things that provoke them, the things about the practice of doing their research in drama, that confound or perplex or challenge, that are lingering, you know, itchy <laughs> issues that keep staying with them as they keep coming back to their research. And I think that that's really an interesting place to start a conversation with different areas of practice. So we arranged the book in terms of design, things that are about how you design research, things that are provocations where a method is a, is a particular provocation to us, the issues about representation, um, and issues of the actual practice, the doing of the drama and the doing of the research. And we really wanted to get them to be interrogative of their own work, but each other's practice. And I, you know, when we read research texts, often it's very, it can be quite hero narrative and it can be like, we did this, we changed the world, you know, <laughs> and, and, and this kind of, this, this has a, 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 and we know why we do that. We know the milieu that we work in is very much about gathering evidence and proving impact and all of those kinds of things. And that's that neoliberal context that we work in. But this is an interesting set of discussions because it talks about what, what irks us or what troubles us. And I think that is a sign of a, an evolved research culture if we can start to turn that lens a bit on the way we do things um, rather than us doing it individually bringing it together in a in a in a single publication um, you can see some of the people that are part of this um, and the the it's mostly it's a largely Australian context but with some variations here and there some of the people that we put together had never worked together or um or research together so they're coming it's almost like speed dating <laughs> for researchers where they had to go hello oh what do you do and they had to go out and read each other's work and and we wanted them to have be quite kind of experienced researchers speaking one-to-one -one, you know this idea of of having this um, sense of being at one with each other but also be able to raise questions with each other that matter um, for the broader field, but also to bring each other's eyes to the problems or the tasks or the research that was in place. So um, some of them were written also in quite different formats. We encourage them to be exper experimental. So some of them are straight conversations. Some of them are uh, letters backwards and forwards. I know that the one that I did with Helen Kale and Vivek and it was, was a series of letters. We got quite... Yeah, you know, Victorian <laughs> in the way, in the way that we sent letters to each other, where we kind of uh, affirmed one another because that we were kind of dancing around theory. So that kind of helped us. Others are like um, Robin Pascoe and Peter Wright's one is like a a a, a, a di digital novel in a cartoon kind of format. John O'Toole and Peter Duffy's one is in script format. 
Um, so there's lots of different formats. The one that I, I was going to highlight, which I probably won't get a chance to do, but you can read it further yourselves, is the one that Richard Salas and I did. So Richard and I are um, Chapter 4, A Research Tango in Three Moves. Richard and I both have an interest in gender in research in the drama classroom and he's the boy guy <laughs> and I'm the girl guy. There are others, but in Australia that seems to be where we, we kind of be the opposites of each other. So he said, wouldn't it be interesting if we came together and actually looked at data that we'd collected in our own research and swapped it so that, you know, a bit of sharing and caring, you know, we gave you a bit of my data, I gave you a bit of, you know, your data and we, we, we looked at each other's data through our gendered, research background so I looked at his boys some of a, a little moment from his boys data he looked at a moment from my girls data and we started to look at what does it mean to have a gender sensitive lens in the way that you conduct research in the classroom and we lamented at the idea that a lot of researchers leave gender right out um, of the mix and it's such a huge fundamental factor in the way everything runs and works um, and and needs to be addressed. And so it was quite interesting to us to actually look at each other's little bite of research from each other and bring our differing lenses to it. And we thought, well, how best can we use this? And, of course, for drama people, metaphors are everything. <laughs> so met the metaphor we used was a tango and to use the structural method of a dance and the because it's a very highly structured dance where we use that kind of structural metaphor to actually engage in a series of moves as we talked about each other's research. Um, and that was enormously freeing as an evocative way for us to actually have that conversation, you know, quite quickly about very deep things in terms of both the data that we've shared but also our practice as, as gender-sensitive um, researchers so you know you can you can pick that one up or, or look to one of the others but uh, it's a really lovely book and I'm immensely proud of it um, and I strongly recommend that one and the and all the others of course as well so where am I at now in terms of what I'm doing um, I'm continuing my work on what's called the Sanctuary Project. So I've received some funding with the International Teaching Artists Collaborative and also some of my college funding uh, to work on a um, big project. Well, I call it big. It's in it's at a, a, a multiple schools. So the first pilot study that I did of this pro particular project was in one school. This time I'm working in four schools. And we've got teachers, teaching artists working in each school I'm looking at the processes involved in stirring drama and the ethical imagination with young people, both primary students and secondary students. The focus for this is very much regional um, areas of interest. So for us in the Hunter, in Awabakal land, wetlands is very important. Um, coal mining is looming large, has done for decades. So really looking at how can drama actually stay with the local and global trouble, noticing the idea of trouble as being a Donna Haraway um, theoretical post-human kind of context, looking at ways that we can embed Indigenous knowledge more deeply into the projects that we do and this idea of caring for country and being on country the particular focus of this project is actually on a migratory bird called the Bartel Godwit. So I forgot to put that in there. Um, and really looking at how we use rolling roll, but particularly with other forms of technology, looking at Prospero Digital, which is a platform that allows students to engage in a, a curated platform uh, that has particular episodes and bites and things that they can relate to and post to. And I'm also going to be using some drone photography to link into students' work with puppetry and in the drama as a whole. And really looking at, for me, what's now the really interesting thing is about how we do drama education where we actually blur the boundaries of reality and fiction in a safe way to help young people feel that they have more sense of action, justice and change and being agents in those those things.
rather than you know inheritors of the mess. <laughs> so that's where I'm up to now. I can share these with the group. Um, a couple of publications that have all come out this year. The first one's about the um, rolling roll work that I'm doing. The second one is about um, devising theatre that I've done with my wonderful PhD student, Katie Walsh, about devising theatre in schools. And the third one is about the artists in schools, sustained partnerships, if you want to. And, of course, the the report that is still available online for that, and I can give you the link if you want to. So other things, sources of information, as my my hat of Drama Australia research director of research, we have a series of research briefs um, that uh, that we where we collate who's doing research in Australia about drama education, and we're always looking for people to to put a little profile up there so that we're getting a sense of who's who and what's happening to get a lie of the land. The other thing that Drama Australia does is host um, biannually is the Chris Sinclair Research Award, which uh, is an award for distinguished research in our field. So if you're doing research in that way, please keep that on your radar. Um, information's on our website about that. The other thing I'd also highlight that NJ, our Drama Australia Research Journal, has actually now gone, gone open access and with back editions. So that's the link for that. Um, where you can get a whole lot of information and wonderful uh, access that you perhaps may not have had before if you weren't a subscriber. So um, I just flagged that one out there. The other thing I should say as well, that I have no connection with this particular book that's on the right-hand side. I just discovered it and I adore it. So I'm sharing it with you <laughs> as a wonderful book about doing a rebellious research. <laughs> It's a wonderfully rich text to have a look at and to have a look at the way people are stretching the parameters of what research is and what is in the academy and beyond it. So highly recommend it. It's taking a lot of my reading at the moment. It's, I'm, I'm loving that book. So that's me done. Uh, Chris, thank you so much <laughs> for such an insightful and interesting presentation. You covered so much territory <laughs> in such a short period of time and I, I couldn't help um, but think just how incredibly agentic your research work is and it oh, surprised me <laughs> yeah when when you finish with that that beautiful um beautiful text which I, I've taken a note of yeah um, big thank you for sharing you. today it was absolutely um there, there's so much to to be thinking more about but your your research examples were also um um so broad and yeah. uh, and yeah there's so much more that I, I'm keen to to explore and unpack um, I'm wondering whether Terry or Lisa, if there's anything that you'd like to to ask about that's come to mind, or anything you'd like to comment upon while we've still got Chris here. I've just got a lot of reading to do now. My <laughs> background is in visual arts. Oh <laughs> right, drama. okay. But I'm partnering with um, Carol Carter, who did a oh, PhD lovely. with Richard Sellers. Yeah. So we're trying to build a creative practice hub at Curtin. So Fantastic. I'm coming from a different perspective, yep. but I've got yep. some really good tips as to where to go now. So thank yeah. you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank no, you. And Carol's come from Newcastle, so oh, yeah, just <laughs> a joy, yeah. a joy Perfect. to have some more people. Um, with that focus on using the language of the arts to, yeah. to share what we're discovering. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, you might find that Fresh Air report interesting because there's a, yeah. a, at least one case study that's very strongly visual arts. Yeah, great. Okay. So Thanks. looking at secondary education. So. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Terry, anything that you'd like to add at all or comment? Um. That was so lovely. Thank you. These these sessions are amazing. I really feel like the the cat that got the cream by attending them. <laughs> um, I'm a I'm a drama teacher teacher as well. It's how my husband describes what I do when people ask him. Mm. So so much of what you said resonates with the the sort of work not the not equivalent, but I'm also working in education and yeah. in drama, um, and currently doing my PhD. And it's just given me so much inspiration, <laughs> so Aww. many ideas, and um. <laughs> Like Lisa said, I also feel like, uh, well, I mean, I'm reading a lot at the moment anyway, yeah. but I feel like the list just got significantly longer. Uh, so thank you. That was oh, really good. exciting and inspiring. Oh, and good. 
I feel like sometimes I'm I'm at that point in my research where it, like I'm in a bit of a tunnel vision and sometimes yeah. it's just so refreshing to get a chance to see the bigger picture yeah. and the possibilities and the scope yeah. and your work is amazing it's so yeah. lovely and exciting <laughs> um yeah so I'm, I feel you. fully Recharged and refreshed. Oh, that's good. That's good. Not that it's about me being recharged and refreshed. No, no, but that's good. That's good. And I, I think the thing is that you know we we're a small community, and of mm. arts educators and arts researchers. So, you know, it's really important to see those synergies, but also to recognise our differences if we're in different art forms. I just I thought it was really ironic with the Fresh Air project that you know Mary and I are both drama people. And the, there was not a drama project in it. You know? So we're, we were kind of like, oh, what do you call that? <laughs> you know? In visual art or in music or in, in dance, you know. Um, so it's it, it's been kind of an interesting project to kind of attend to as a non, non re, not representing my field, but seeing the, the uh, and this is contentious, but seeing there are things that unite us. There are things that travel across and it's about how we frame them. And certainly I've been, certainly, I mean, I had to talk about this here, but you know, Robin and I and others have been heavily involved in advocacy and curriculum change and um, supporting authorities in curriculum development, et cetera, and pushing for change and things where change isn't happening well enough, et cetera. Um, you know, and that that's an ongoing issue because you know that sometimes research, if it isn't in the research, you know, it's sometimes it's hard to say, you know, this is what we need. And and certainly, I know as researchers, we're often looking for the evidence, looking for the mm -hmm. the the documents that are going to and the the cases that are going to support, um, because there are other challenges at a curriculum level that we all know that are massive. You know, and and if we're not in print we're not there mm -hmm. <laughs> you know like it, it's got to that point now where it's really about that not just about the nuances of what's in print it's it's also about <laughs> yeah are we there at all yeah. um which is sort of back to the future-ish in a kind of a way so research has such a fundamental part in in keeping that bubble bubbling along you know yeah. and keeping that um support there and you know certainly you know, while we all have our own, you know, different art forms have different ways of working and different languages and different uh, contributions to make and ways of working, um, you know, it, it's also very, very worthwhile to be looking at, you know, what we contribute to the climate of education right now and young people's experience of schooling, mm. um, which even with, you know, like a pandemic, you know, has had a massive effect on all of that but it's also been an opportunity for other political things to be happening mm. through the back door mm. Mm. <laughs> you know which which always makes me you know I mean I had a student ask me aren't you tired Chris mm. I said yeah I'm exhausted actually you know I'm still like the feminists you know, I'm still arguing about this shit <laughs> you know we're still we're still trying to to get established stuff that's clearly been established and 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 you know is clearly ignored mm -hmm. it's no longer you know surreptitiously ignored it's actually blatantly ignored yeah. Yeah. and and you know i i find that then puts even more responsibility on research mm -hmm. to be still knocking down those doors and saying hey <laughs> You know, you cannot erase us. <laughs> mm -hmm. You cannot um, sideline us. You know, this 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 body and this field is still growing, and um, and is still you know a value. You just can't okay. don't see it right now. So you know, I think it's it it has huge impacts in terms of the places that we work in, the systems, the institutions, mm -hmm. the the advantages that are given to some and not to others, the equity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm not alone here with arts folks, but, you know, this idea that, you know, your ex access to arts education is de decided by your postcode and your parents' salary mm -hmm. is an appalling state of affairs. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I mean, the whole, my whole interest in rolling roll is to getting, is for getting more kids doing drama. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, really, this will be on the record. They'll probably, hopefully the schools are not watching this uh, right now. But, you know, really it's about equity of access and, yeah. and, and the political um, rights of the child to have those experiences and have that quality education there for the arts and not to have it undermined and um, railroaded uh, into being nothing. Mm. And I think sadly we we it's you know having had that argument drummed into me at university undergrad, it's still there. It's there in different ways, but it's still there. Okay. So um, there are still fights to be had, and this puts even more pressure on researchers to be making sure that we are very articulate in the way that we. Yeah. Um, explain what we do <laughs> well, you've been incredibly articulate today chris in in sharing with us and perhaps you you might be able to come back at some stage next year and um share some more of your research with yeah everybody. happy to it'll be you know get, let me get the beginning of next year over but um i'll <laughs> come in with my gopros and uh, <laughs> We would love, we would love that kind of to, um, to hear yeah, how so that yeah. actually unfolds. That would be, be really wonderful. Yeah. Um, Thank you. And Lisa and Terry, it's been beautiful to have you join Thank us. Thank you for coming. Um, Thank, you. Thank you. In, in the next You're couple of welcome. days, you'll probably get an email, uh, given that this is our last um, session, asking for feedback and suggestions for, for future planning. So um, really encourage you if there are particular aspects of arts informed research that you would like to explore um, and have some sessions on next year do um do respond um, because we, we would love to be able to um be responsive to to people's needs and, and interests uh, well thank you again chris that's and, okay uh, thank you really appreciate you uh, what a beautiful way to to end our series uh this year um, it was a beautiful bookend that you provided and oh, good. such an interesting session. Wow. So thank you. Big thank you to you. Thank Go you well, for inviting everyone, me. And I um, hope to see you all next year. Yeah. yeah.